Welcome back to lab. Welcome back to EE for everyone. Today we're going to be talking about something near and dear to my heart, the next step of our comparator series. That's right. We're talking about Kirchhoff's voltage law and mesh circuit analysis. It is going to be a lot of fun. This is basically a core theory, right? We were just talking about um, nodal analysis and some voltage division, very basic elements of circuit analysis. And we're going to level that up a little bit, go a little bit higher up the food chain, so a little bit more math, a little bit more theory, but it will set us up to do some very complex circuit analysis. I'm excited and I hope that you are too. It's a big part of this. Uh, we've got a new display capture deal going on. I'm pretty pumped about it. So um, thank you, No Corporation, or uh, forget your new handle on Patreon. Uh, thank you so much for reaching out on the Slack channel and giving me this great idea. You just said Wacom tablet. And I was like, wait a minute, I got something kind of like that. Well, here we go. We are doing something awesome because of you. Thank you. I love it when you guys give me great ideas. Okay. Anyways, let's get into this. We were talking about KVL. And what is KVL? Well, this is Kirchhoff's Laws. So Kirchhoff was a very smart guy. Uh, I'll throw an image up there if I can. But he was a really smart guy that uh, had something to say about something. And the general idea of Kirchhoff's voltage law Oh, I really hope I'm not saying current. So there's a, his current law and his voltage law. We're talking about the voltage law today. We'll get to the current law later. At any rate, basically that tells us that the sum of all voltages around a closed loop in a circuit is equal to zero, right? So the sum of all voltages must be equal to zero. What does that mean? Let's draw a little picture. Um, so let's say, no, 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 no. No, I made this mistake before. We're not doing that again. Let's say we have a voltage source. Yes. And then we've got, you know, let's say we've got this. Let's even, let's get a little crazy. Let's put a diode in there. It does not matter, right? So we've got this circuit, right? There's a closed loop. Current can flow. Hmm. And just for good taste, I'll put our ground reference in there. Okay. So current can flow. That's great. Um, so basically we've got this polarity marker over here. And what we need to do is we need to assign a polarity to all of these components. And it's very, very important that you arrange them this way. All loads have the same sign and it's opposite from the source. Why? Because voltage is dropping across those components, right? It There's a more positive voltage here. Let's say it's a volt or two than there is here. That's just the way that it works because current is flowing in this direction. We know there's some impedance, there's some resistance. Okay, so this is kind of like the fundamental building block. And we're just going to call this Z1 and Z2. Uh, this might be a little high level, but there's two fundamental theories. There's a fundamental theory of resistance and impedance. And resistance is pure resist, right? It's a resistor. It's a chunk of carbon. It's a piece of wire. It is something that is pretty much an ideal resistor. An impedance does not make that assumption. So it could be a capacitor, it could be an inductor, it could be a diode, it could be a transistor, but functionally it has an electrical impedance. That is in one operating state, whatever you're in, there is some equivalent resistance that you can apply and that is impedance. It's kind of like resistance with assumptions or special rules. Yeah, I don't want to get us hung up on that though. So we're probably going to switch back to resistors whenever we start doing real math. At any rate, um, just kind of want to walk through kind of just some things that we know, right? We know a couple things about the situation. We know since this is a closed loop of current, we know that the current through the supply and these two impedances must be the same, that I1 for these three components is constant. We know that for sure. And so how do we start building this equation? Okay, so this is coming back to Ohm's law. This is an application of Ohm's law. So we need to remember 
V equals I times R. That is going to be critical as we move forward. And as we're keeping that in mind, what are we doing? Okay, easy. Easy. So, uh, we need to give this a name. We'll call this V1. V1 plus negative, right? Because V1 is positive. This has an opposite sign. So that means it needs to be negative. Negative. Z1 times I1. Now, how in the world can I do that? I'm basically just saying I'm adding a resistance with a voltage. What? No, I'm not, right? Because we have a resistance and we have a current. So there's resistance times current, which is equal to a voltage. So we're saying V1 plus the voltage across that second impedance plus the voltage across that third impedance is zero. That's it. It's just saying if we've got five volts in one part of the circuit, and then we've got two loads in series, we know that five volts needs to be dropped across that load because there's nowhere else for it to go, right? If there's a resistor and a voltage source, current will flow and the voltage across that resistance will be five volts. Maybe a better way to do this as a very oversimplified example, let's apply this to one resistor and one voltage source in case that wasn't excruciatingly obvious to you. Um, we're just gonna apply this theory and I think it'll look very, very similar. This might help us to draw a parallel. So we're gonna do Ohm's law over here and we're going to do KVL over here. Okay. And the circuit we're gonna do this with is a very, very, very simple circuit. We're going to have V1, we're gonna have R1. Basically what we're going to say is zero equals V1 plus negative R1 times I1, where I1 is flowing in that direction. Okay. And if we take Ohm's law and we think about this, right, we've got V equals I times R. We know this is true. And the voltage is V1, okay, equals I1 times R1. Huh. It just doesn't look quite right. Uh, hmm. Looks like there's a little bit, of, little bit of algebra that we need to do. So let's see if we can fix this. Uh, let's see if we can fix this. Okay, so we've got this plus negative R1 I1. But if we add negative R1 I1 to both sides, what we end up with is, uh, sorry, add R1 I1 to both sides, we end up with R1 times I1 equals V1 plus zero, because negative R1 I1 plus R1 I1 is zero. So sweet, and now, whoa, that is exactly the same. Look at that, V equals I times R, Ohm's law is held true, which is important because Ohm's law is a law. It can't be wrong, it must always be right. So no matter what we're adding to this theory, no matter how we're expanding circuit analysis, if we do a really simple gut check and just say, all right, does this still agree? Yes, good, these are not in conflict. That is excellent. But of course, this is not what you would apply KVL to. You would apply KVL to a much more complicated circuit, right? So let's do that same situation, but with a couple voltage sources. Uh, so let's say we've got V1, and then let's say we've got uh, resistor. Uh, let's say we have a resistor here. And then we have a resistor here, and then a resistor here, and a voltage source. I think we did something similar to this before. So we got V1, V2, R1, R2, R3. Here's our ground reference. Let's go ahead and apply signs 
to all of these components. R2 is a little tricky now, eh? So the sign. Uh, all right, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm pretty sure this will all work out. If it doesn't, we'll figure out that I did it wrong. <laughs> so we've got I1 and I2. We've got two current loops. Two closed current paths. Now I'm pretty sure I've got to label R2 this way. Almost positive, but I might get that wrong. And if we get that wrong, we're about to find out. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so let's start building our equations, all right? So we've got zero equals V1. Actually, let's say negative V1, because I don't want to add. Wah. Sorry about that. Let's do negative V1 because I don't want this to come out with all these negative signs. So then we're going to do plus I1 R1 plus R3 I1. Really should have kept that consistent. And that's the whole loop. But we have a second equation. Then we have a negative V2. Uh, plus, uh, so looking at the sign, this is all relative to that current loop. So if that direction is negative, then the other two are positive. Oh, wait, 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 I forgot one. I forgot one. I forgot one. Minus R3 I2. You cannot forget that. You cannot forget that. This is a critical piece. That is so important. That's so important. Don't forget that. Because that is the link between these two current loops. So why is R3 negative when we're talking about I2? Well, because if you look at the arrows, if you look at the direction of current flow, it's opposite, right? I1 flows this way, I2 flows this way. So we know that the current needs to be the opposite sign. Okay. So now let's let's keep going. So now we got I uh sorry, I2 times R2 plus I two times R three minus I one times R three. There we go. Those are our two equations. And if I did, if I applied this theory correctly, this should all work out just fine. Okay, what is next? This is where things get a little messy. This is where math starts to get a little messy. So right now we just have two true statements written down on paper and our next step is quite literally to uh, kind of mash out the system of equations and solve it. We want to solve one of these equations for I1 or I2 and that will let us plug it into the other equations. So uh, let's pick our favorite one. Let's solve for I2. Two. Okay, we're going to take this equation and we're going to solve. No, 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 no. We're going to take this equation and solve for I2. And we're going to do that by moving everything over to the other side of the equation first off. So then we've got V1 minus I1, R1 minus I1. Okay, we're gonna do two steps at once because I cannot stand this. So we're gonna do R1 plus R3. 
what did we just do, right? If you multiply I1 out, you get I1 times R3 and I1 times R1. That's exactly the same as what we have here. I just combine those terms. And then uh, we are left with equals negative I2 R3. Great. And with this complete, we are quite, quite, quite close. Just divide both sides by R3. And uh, negative one. And there you go. We know what I2 is. Great. And then you can plug that in and you can plug this into your second equation and you are left with a wonderful, wonderful set of equations where you can, well, you, you get the answer. At some point, uh, depending on what you're doing, this is kind of where things break down. Um, in my college years, I believe we would eventually plug some numbers into this situation. We would actually assign a value to the above. Um, that's typically not where I find the strength of this circuit analysis method. The way that I typically apply this is I would be using this to solve for like some kind of general form of an equation. Like, let's say I've got 15 comparator circuits or 15 op amp circuits on a board. And I just want to run the circuit analysis once so I can plug in a couple key values like what's my threshold? What's my gain? What am I going for here? And then it spits out like uh, correct values. You can get E96. Orderable parts. That's typically what I would use this for, that kind of, I need to run this analysis 15 times and I want to do the work once. Yeah, I don't know. Like sometimes you just need to dive into analytical methods. That's what you use this for. It's an analytical method. It's a tool. It's a tool. Um, so I guess where I would land the plane depends on what I'm doing. So yeah, right. This would build a master equation if you plug this in for I2 into the other equation and yada, yada, yada. You can do things like solve for I2 with respect to R1 or you whatever you want to do. It's, it's, it's an equation that describes the system. Okay, I looked at a couple examples online um, from a couple sources, one being Wikipedia because I mm, love those guys. But yeah, so basically both of them took it in a different way. One of them just left it with the, the coefficients with the equations. The other one did what we already did where they did a simple example and compared it to Ohm's law. So I'll count this as complete. Check, done. Kirchhoff's voltage law. Um, as we're wrapping this up, I just want to take a moment to say a big reason why I decided to break up the comparator series into smaller videos rather than more condensed ones is just because I know that the world is crazy right now. Like things are shutting down. There's a lot of people at home. And if there's anything, even a small thing, like giving you a piece of content to look forward to, to help get you through your day. You know what? I want to do that for you. So that's what we're doing. We're going to break this up instead of doing like all of Kirchhoff's laws and a big design example all in one go. We're going to do Kirchhoff's voltage law and then the current law and then the design example. So this is the framework. This is the groundwork for KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law. Thank you for watching EE for everyone. Uh, thank you to our lovely, lovely patrons. Thank you so much. Uh, there's a link down in the description. If you want to see your name in this list, seriously, thank you. Thank you so much. You can get my spindly, spindly handwriting. <laughs> Writing. Yeah, that's what it is. Normally open. No corp. Normally open. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for inspiring me to be my best and for keeping the lights on. I appreciate you. If you like this video and you can't wait for more, let me know by getting subscribed, hitting that like button, and leaving a comment down below. Coming up soon, we'll be continuing to explore Kirchhoff's laws with a de design example and then continuing on our comparator series. I can't wait. If you'd like to support the channel, don't forget to hit that like button, get subscribed, and consider checking out our Patreon page linked in the description. It really helps us out a lot. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Everyone who has decided to become a member, you're a big part of keeping this all.
possible. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thanks for watching it for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye.